Hello, and welcome to The Little Things in Yarnum, episode 5. Uh, so, before I actually start this episode, I want to talk about some kind of personal stuff, and it's probably, and it's, it's definitely not for everybody, um, so if you don't, if you don't really care about, like, me, like, my problems and my, and that, my, uh, you know, my self-pity and that sort of shit, I'll probably add in some kind of, like, annotation or something where you can just skip to where I talk about, like, the actual content, but, um, I kind of want to start by going over some something personal because uh if you're watching this you're probably surprised that it, it's here at all um about a week ago i published really what was my definitive version of of the pale blood hunt which is 108 fucking pages go read it if you haven't already it's my plug and in in that post i said that it it was very likely my last piece of Bloodborne related content that I was going to be publishing. And the reason for that is that I, I really sort of let Bloodborne and I, I really developed this serious obsession and I really sort of let it overtake me, my, my passion for this game and that sort of thing, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that, that probably I've, I've written more and I've done more and I've spent more time thinking about and looking at Bloodborne's story than anyone on the world, in the planet, inclu probably including Miyazaki. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the time I wonder if my story is more complicated and more twisted and more uh, confusing than Miyazaki's and that I just connected all these dots that weren't there and I made this whole thing. And I, you know, I guess I kind of know how Gehrman felt when he was just obsessing over uh, this thing in his life that, that mattered so much to him and he had so much passion for and so he created something that he, he he created something that he wanted to be a representation of that thing and at the end of the day it just it, it was something different it was something else and for me my story of bloodborne i i really put so much passion and, and energy into it that it was it was really physically draining i don't i don't know if I don't think a lot of people realize just how how physically exhausting the act of writing is. Just just writing paragraphs like like it can be sometimes you know sometimes it comes really quick, but other times it's it's just so difficult to put your thoughts into words. And it occurred to me today because I was having some some kind of con I was having some conversation with some guy on the Bloodborne subreddit over uh, whether or not Ibratas is kin of the Cosmos or not. She is, by the way. That's a fact. That's not even my interpretation. That Ibratas is kin. Um, like yeah, that's it's blatant fact. Um, and, and it occurred to me that this guy I was having a conversation with like didn't even know what the distinction between kin and, and great one are and when i was writing the pale, the new version of the pale blood hunt and i went back and i reread all my old chapters like i was stunned at how simple and how obvious it seemed right on time how simple and obvious these things were like when i wrote about Jura and about the powder kegs. Jesus Christ, it's raining outside. He's soaked. When I was writing about Jura and the powder kegs and like the idea that the powder kegs were the ones who burned down old Yarnum. And like that was, it was revolutionary, this idea. 
And so it makes me really realize that in the in the eight months since I started writing about Bloodborne, and since I started thinking about Bloodborne, all the connections I've made and all the the details that I've put together and and all of this information I've sort of gathered together, it's all become second nature to me just to think about it and to talk about it and to and to just theorize about it and all of these little details that sort of weave together. It's all, I have all this information just bursting at the seams, but, but other people don't have this. They're just starting out on their journey uh, to come up with their story. A lot of people are, are, are just, you know, they're still trying to piece together what, what the fuck is going on with Yosefka, you know, which seems so simple now, but it's not, it's really not. It's so complicated. And at the time, you know, it was like the wild west and we were like, like people were going, wait a second, there's a queen Yarnum. Wow. That's crazy. Um, so when I, when I look back now at all of this information that I've gathered and all of this time and energy I've put into, it really is it really is like a like a huge obsession and a huge passion of mine, and I I really kind of allowed it to sort of take over my perception of who I am in a certain way. Um, because, you know, every time I would release an essay or something and I got, people would say like, wow, you're so smart, you figured these things out. And that, 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 that felt so good. You know, it feels so good to be, to, for when people say, wow, you're so smart, I can't believe you figured this out. It, it really, it really gets you there. And you wanna, you wanna release more. It's like a drug. It really is like a drug, that, that feeling of approval that other people have value in your work. And you want to release better and better and better content and and more and more and more so that people can can appreciate you so that you can hear people say wow you're so smart and and at, at, it got to the point where a lot of the time when i was writing i i wasn't writing for for me anymore i was writing because I needed other people's validation. I needed people to, th I needed that feeling of, you know, you're so smart, you're so, and you're so good, you're so cool. And that was how I found value in myself was through other people confirming that I had something of value, that I was special, that I was sexually attractive, that I was smart, that I was, you know, uh, charismatic, that I was funny, that all of these things that you put into your, the, the way you, you see yourself and the way you get value of your own self and from other people's perceptions. And I really got uncomfortable with that, with the fact that I needed other people's approval in order to feel good about myself. And you know, that was one of the reasons why the whole plagiarism thing was so stressful for me. It was because, you know, on one hand, like, you know, am I just being paranoid? Am I crazy? Am I uh, just seeing demons where there are none? And the other hand, it's like, did he steal my, my fame? Did he steal my, uh, you know, my rightful approval? Because, you know, you know, you see, I see like Vati's videos and he has like a million viewers and it's like, wow. And you know, you are, I, you are jealous to a certain degree when you see it, you know, you do think like that could have been me that could, I, why couldn't it, why couldn't I be famous? Why couldn't I have millions of fans? And so you, it, it does affect you to a certain degree. And I didn't like that about myself. I didn't like that. I was affected that deeply by it. So I said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to have closure. I'm going to release the Pale Blood Hunt finished. I'm going to put it out there and I'm just going to leave it all behind. And I'm just going to move on. Um, and that's, that's, that was what I planned to do, but clearly you're watching a video right now. And it occurred to me that 
a lot of what I do, I do because it, it occurred to me, somebody asked on the Bloodborne subreddit if anybody had any advice for coming up with the lore on their own. This guy didn't want to, um, he didn't want to read like a summary. He wanted to, uh, he wanted to come up with the ideas on his own. He wanted, and he was looking for tips on how to do that, you know, like, uh, advice on how to connect the dots on his own so he could come up with his own story. And it brought me all the way back to the very first thing I, I wrote for the Bloodborne community, which was my, my Bloody Crow theory. And, and the reason I wrote that was so that I could come up with a better understanding. And, and that thread, where's this guy who was just starting out on his journey, who knows, you know, eight months from now, he could be writing a 128-page thesis. And, you know, this guy who's just starting out on his, his own journey of delving into Bloodborne really sort of made me remember why I did it in the first place, which was I did it because I fucking, I love the game. And... That's why I'm I'm making this video, uh, because I'm not making this video for you. <laughs> I know that sounds it sounds like a, a it's a fucking nasty thing to say, right? Like this isn't for you, this is for me. Um, but yeah, but that's that's why I'm doing it. I'm making this video right now because I want to make it, and that is a good feeling. Um, and that's all that I really had to say. I just. Sometimes it feels good to just sort of vent all this stuff. That's all I really wanted to say. Um, so if you sat through that, you know, thank you for listening to me ramble on in my parents' house. Uh, I don't even have my Bloodborne game here. I couldn't even play it if I wanted to. I uh, am currently in like a limbo right now because... I moved to a new apartment, but, like, there were problems with the uh, house, and we had to get, or not the, the, the house that my apartment is in, and it had to get rewired and everything, so, like, right now, half of my stuff is in my apartment, and half of my stuff is just sitting in my parents' house, so I'm, like, in this weird limbo where, like, all my books and, like, my video game consoles are in my apartment, but my computer is in my parents' house. It's, like, super weird. But, so, here I am, and I'm just gonna ramble about Bloodborne. For me this time not for you so I'm, I'm gonna take like five seconds and then I'm gonna like introduce it formally introduce the episode formally like just like so me this is me getting ready hello <laughs> I can't do that with straight face Hello, and welcome to the fifth episode. Greetings, everybody who decided to skip the personal bullshit. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about poison in Bloodborne. Because poison is um, something that I, I've, I've thought a lot about lately. Um, give me just one second. I'm actually... I actually need to turn this off for just like two seconds. Okay. Sorry about that. I got a weird message, but it turned out to be nothing. Okay. Welcome to the fifth episode of The Little Things in Yarnum. I'm your host, Redgrave, and today we're going to be talking about poison. Now, poison in video games is something that we're so hard conditioned to, to not give a fuck about. You know, like, like it, we're so, it's so ingrained in our video game DNA that poison is just this abstract, irrelevant, sort of status effect that just exists as a gameplay mechanic that we never really sit down and, and think about what the poison is. Mostly for gameplay reasons, because, you know, it would be such a pain in the ass if you didn't get 
you know, afflicted by poison. It's every different kind of monster you fought had had you got afflicted by a new type of status effect for like, uh, oh, you've been injected with you know rattlesnake venom. It's like it's simpler to just call everything poison. But in in Bloodborne, poison is very um, very there's there's a there's a layer to it that needs to be explored. Um, the most obvious case of poison in Bloodborne is Ash and Blood which is the, the the disease that ravaged old Yarnum. And that's what then the antidote tablets that we take to cure poison uh, were developed specifically to treat ashen blood. And as a lot of people, myself included, have noted and have gone over, uh, ashen blood uh, was was very likely, and, and all the evidence seems to point towards ashen blood being developed uh, by the healing church and introduced into the population of old Yarnum. Um, for a multitude of reasons, to drum up support, uh, to give them a new avenue of research, uh, to swell their numbers, and a lot of other reasons. So what I did for this episode was I, I actually went through the game and I tried to document every single case of poison I could find in the entire game, including the DLC. And I tried to, to write down literally everything that causes poison. Now, I'm sure I missed a few. So if you, can, if you come up with any that I missed, I'm sure there's one or two, at least one or two. Feel free to let me know. And, you know, maybe I'll go over it in my next video whenever that happens. Um, so I'm actually, I actually went ahead and compiled all of this stuff into a spreadsheet that I made. Oh, no. Is it not working? Oh, this was going to be so cool. Hang on. Oh, no. <laughs> this was going to be so awesome. Oh, that's so sad. Yes! There we go. Awesome. Fuck yeah. All right. Whew, crisis averted. Okay, so I went ahead. <laughs> Holy shit, that was close. Uh, I went ahead and I... Let me see if I can zoom this in and make it a little... I don't know how... I don't know um, how well it shows... Up. By the way, there's a little jump cut right there because I accidentally closed uh, or stopped the recording. So you didn't miss anything. I just hit the pause button by accident and then I just immediately hit record again so that's what that was uh, as you can tell I am not very good with video editing software anyway so let me see if I can uh, zoom in on this a little bit to make it a little more legible um, let's see can we do that you know what fuck it you guys you guys have eyes you can see so I went ahead and I compiled every source of poison I could find and I, I put it into three categories enemies that cause poison uh, items that cause poison and the uh, the swamps the four places in the game where um, there's like actual swamps that you can walk in to, to cause poison and I also went ahead and I uh, color coded them by slow poison and rapid poison so obviously purple being slow poison and red being rapid poison and the first the very first thing that really sticks out to me about all of this right here is that there's absolutely no trace whatsoever of the kin or of the great ones anywhere here in any of these there's no trace whatsoever of the kin or of the great ones of uh, the crawlers which you fight in the nightmare frontier a lot of people, or I don't know, but some people think these are kin, or these are like great ones, or something. But they they don't take the damage bonus, the damage bonus to kin. Um, they're they're technically neutral enemies, according to the official guidebook. So they're they're not kin. So uh, as far as I can see here, there's absolutely no link whatsoever to any kin or to any great ones. That's the first thing that really sticks out to me. So because these are sort of 
vague descriptions, I, I went ahead and I categorized these into three different main categories that I could discern, which is we have Ash and Blood, which contains the female beast patients, specifically the female beast patients, which is weird. Um, the female beast patients are the ones that have the, the cloak over their heads. They're the ones that, um, they're a little bit bigger in Old Yarnum. Um, it's interesting because those are the ones that, that give poison or that cause poison. It's not the, the normal beast patients, which are presumably the male beast patients. Although they can, if they're like affected by a buff that the female beast patients can give them. Like the female beast patients can roar and it gives the normal beast patients red eyes and gives them poison tax. And so the beast patients with red eyes can cause poison, slow poison. Also, we see the scourge beasts uh, can cause poison, but only the ones with red eyes can cause poison. The blue-eyed ones that you fight in the Upper Cathedral Ward, uh, they don't cause poison. And so in both cases, we have these, these red eyes as being a signifier for, for poisonous. There's also obviously the blood-starved beast, straight up. Uh, the poison knife, which the description of the poison knife states that it's a weapon used uh, by the healing church doctors in, in self-defense. So... I mean, that seems perfectly lo a perfectly logical step um, is that they, they just use this sort of weaponized variant of, of Ashen Blood in self-defense. You know, they just coat the knife in Ashen Blood and toss it right at you. Um, there's also, in, this is from the, the DLC, uh, if, when you go to the, the Nightmare Research Hall, there's that swampy center. Um, going in there causes slow poison which is kind of interesting because, you know, we know that it's sort of the research hall of the healing church in its formative era. So, you know, it makes sense that they might have been doing research on ash and blood there and in that sort of place. So that's pretty cool. So this is, that's the, that's the first category, or I guess in my spreadsheet, it's the third category of poison. Uh, over here, we've got things related to the vile bloods, uh, which is kind of, kind of interesting and and you'll probably note right away that ashen blood very slow poison heavy vile blood's very rapid poison heavy which is pretty cool uh the hinter tombs in the chalice dungeons i don't i don't know if that's necessarily there um in the vile blood category i put it there because the vile bloods are very heavily associated with the thumarians and the hinter tombs are a part of the thumarian labyrinths that's the only reason I put it there. There's that whole swamp in the Hinter Tombs um, that's a poisonous swamp. So that's the only reason I put it there, just because it's in the Thumerian Labyrinth. Uh, the Chikage, and I guess this this also goes for the rest of the blood blades that they used, because we know from the description of the Rakuyo that there was more than one type of, of Kanehurst blood blade. But the Chikage causes rapid poison, and the way it does it, it is pretty interesting. Um, you, you actually... You, the Canehurst Knights, the Vile Bloods, would cut themselves and they'd soak the blade in that in their own blood. And their blood caused rapid poison. Which 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 is you know, you don't really think about it at first, but it's not like, you know, they the the sword is activated by their blood and then it like grows poison. It's like, no, the, the poisonous part is the blood on it. Go over there, Calvin. All right, next we've got Murgo's Attendants. These are, I associate these with the uh, the Vile Bloods because uh, Mergo, or Murgo, was uh, the child of Queen Yarnum, and Murgo's Attendants were likely either created by the School of Mensis or by the, the Thumerians in the first place to, to watch over the Child of Blood that would have been Mergo. Um, and Murgo's attendants, the ones that use rapid poison, are the the jester-hatted ones, the small guys, uh, with the crossbows. And the crossbow bolts cause rapid poison. So maybe it's the case that, like, you know, there's blood, infected blood, on the crossbow bolts, and when they fire it, and 60, and it causes the rapid poison. Next we have the blood liquors. Um, the blood liquors cause poison. And I don't know if this is new, 
because I never, I can't recall getting afflicted by poison before the DLC, but the, the blood liquors all over the River of Blood in the Hunter's Nightmare, those cause poison, which I, I, I'm not sure if that's new or not, because I, I, don't, I don't remember them causing poison before. I wish I had my, uh, my guidebook handy for reference, but I don't because it's at my apartment. Um, and lastly, in our vile blood category, we have... Oh, and blood liquors I associate with vile bloods because they're all over Canehurst. Um, and lastly, we have Queen Yarnum. And Queen Yarnum's blood cause, also causes rapid poison. And, you know, weirdly enough, you know, it's the exact same method as the Chikage, which is she takes her knife and she stabs herself... And now her knife is coated in, in her blood, and she tries to kill you with it, and it causes rapid poison. Very similar. So those are our two categories of poison. And now we have our last category of poison. Now, I named it vermin. It's, it's not necessarily the vermin from the League. For now, we're just going to call it vermin, and then I'll go into those connections later. Okay? So... Uh, this has to do basically with the snake parasites in the Forbidden Woods. Um, this, in the Forbidden Woods, there's that swamp behind Yosefka's clinic. And, you know, obviously what everybody remembers about um, Forbidden Woods are the snakes. You know, the, vi the, uh, the viper pits, is that what they're called? The, uh, like the big balls of snakes. And then the snake parasites. And those all cause poison. I don't remember if the Shadows of Yarnum boss fight, if the snake, if those snakes cause poison. Uh, I should have checked that. But I, either way, it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so, so those snakes cause poison. Uh, the man-eater boars cause poison. Um, and then we also have... So those, those are three cases of poison. And... Then we then if we go a bit to the nightmare frontier, basically this vermin category is is going to make more sense after I go over everything. The nightmare frontier uh, is there's that huge swamp in the nightmare frontier where the crawlers live, um, and that's a place where you can find poison. And it's very similar to the forbidden woods. It's 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 really similar. And if we remember. Um, the Nightmare Frontier is a reflection of Lauren, the Thumerian uh, city of Lauren. And what happened in Lauren is a reflection, or not a reflection, but what happened in, in Lauren, the same thing is happening in, in Yarnum now. So we can sort of envision Lauren as a, as a snapshot or a, a look of what's to come 2,000 years from now when Yarnum is nothing but ruins and... You know, and and all the towers have tumbled, and all the the beings have wasted away. What's going to be left is something that will probably look a lot like the Nightmare Frontier, like like Lauren. And in and in Lauren, we have that swamp with the crawlers in it. Now, what's what's more is and and now we're going to get into why I call this the category the vermin is in all of these swamps there are these little maggots that 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 they swirl around and they jump at you in packs and and they erupt out of the silver beasts and there's a gigantic one living inside the corpse of the headless bloodletting beast um after the DLC, I'm not 100% anymore whether or not that's Lawrence's corpse. It's still, it's definitely still a possibility, uh, but I'm leaning now away from that idea. Which is a shame because I, I, was, I was behind that idea for so long. But once again, my ideas on Lawrence, I think for the fourth time, Bloody Crow, Blood Minister, Headless Bloodling Beast... Yes, yeah, so this is the fourth time that my Lawrence theory has changed. Um, but anyway, doesn't matter. Inside of that that corpse, there's a gigantic maggot 
that is controlling it. And that maggot, when that maggot attacks you, it causes rapid poison. Not when the bloodletting beast attacks you, not when its blood attacks attack you. Only when that maggot sort of jabs at you, if it gets you with its pincers, it causes rapid poison. And there's also the Gravekeeper Scorpions in the depths of the labyrinth that cause rapid poison. And what's kind of cool is if you look at really close at the Gravekeeper Scorpion models, I might have, I don't know, one somewhere here in the ether. Uh, they're kind of like these little worms sticking out of it. Um, so, Because there's two variations of the Gravekeeper Scorpion. One where it has its shell on, and then the other one where like the shell is cracked open, and you can sort of see the, like, these worms slithering out. So I, I kind of like the idea that maybe that scorpion is just jam-packed full of these maggots, and that's what's causing the rapid poison. Um, and then, so finally, back in the Nightmare Frontier, we have the crawlers. The crawlers are a super weird enemy. They're very Lovecraftian. Like, they're, they're right out of Lovecraft. They, you know, probably, like, sort of like moon beasty creatures. Right out of, like, Unknown Kadath and, and that stuff. Um... The dream quest of Unknown Kadath. So very, they're very Lovecraftian monsters, and they're always surrounded by these these maggots and these vermin. And um, you know, I could I could probably go in for like an hour on the the crawlers just because they look so cool. Um, I don't know if you've ever actually like looked up close at that at the uh, the models for the crawlers that live in the swamp, but. It's like everything about them is so cool like they have these mouths and then obviously you know what everyone knows is like how the messengers like the the rotten messengers sort of spew the poisonous gas and that's what's caused this the rapid poison by the way um but just you know just like the the whole model for the the crawlers is, is super cool if you've never like taken a close look at them you, should, you totally should because they're really weird anyway so now what we've got is we've got three very distinct kinds of poison. We've got poison that is vile blood. That's what that poison is. We've got poison that is caused by the vermin, which can, includes like these these maggots that have infected things and have have turned them rotten and filthy inside. And we've got ashen blood, uh, which is caused by the disease that the healing church uh, put into Old Yarnum. So. And the, those dogs will shut the fuck up eventually, so. I think we're okay. Anyway, so, and we've got Ashen Blood, which is, so, first of all, I think we can safely come to this conclusion that these two kinds of poison are the same. So where do we find these vermin? Uh, ignoring for a second the Nightmare Frontier part, the Forbidden Woods and the Snake Parasites, we learn from the uh, the new DLC, this is cool new information, uh, about the Madaris twins, who were these two twin brothers who lived in the Forbidden Woods, and they they grew up in the wilds alongside a, a snake, their, like their pet snake. and But it wasn't really a pet to them, you know, because like they were like wild folk and and they were like weird folk and so they they grew up like in communion with this snake communion yeah, pun not intended um and eventually they were discovered by Walter, who trained them as hunters and uh had them join the league and what these these twins would do is they would go out and they would hunt and they would drag the filth ridden vermin back to the woods they'd chop up the beasts they toss some of the entrails and food to their pet snake, and the rest, according to, I believe it's the Madaris whistle, but uh, I'll double check that. There's an item description that says they would they would give the remains to the villagers of the Forbidden Woods for use in their research. And when we look at the Forbidden Woods, this is where the Healing Church found Ashen Blood. Right behind Yosefka's clinic is that big swamp with all the maggots in it. 
and and when we go to the forbidden woods that's where we find the white church garb and that's where we find antidotes and that's where we find poison knives that's the forbidden woods is where the healing church developed ashen blood for the use in their experimentation and what we learn from the butcher mask is that one day the Madaris twins discovered vermin even inside of their beloved snake and it drove them mad and the younger killed the older the vermin those those wriggling little centipedes um what are they you know the Madaris twins would find beasts that were filled with vermin they drag them back into the forbidden woods chop them into pieces feed them to their snake smear the blood all over the place and the vermin in these corpses you know probably started to infect the wildlife infecting the snakes infecting the boars the rats now the villagers couldn't see the vermin only those who have been branded with impurity the uh oath rune of the covenant of the uh the league not covenant that's an as an aside we need to stop calling them covenants because they're not covenants they're oaths the only reason people call them covenants is because of the dark souls connotations uh people started only those who have the impurity oath rune uh can see the vermin so you know the villagers just started you know the healing church just started using these little maggots unaware of of what they were actually using and you know chopping up da, 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 da. we've got this cool new poison and and little did they know they were they were spreading the filth spreading the vile vermin everywhere so that being said you know i think it's safe to say we can conclude this now if we look at the red eyes something kind of cool is that in the hunter's nightmare in the dlc there are certain npc hunters that drop vermin and those are the ones that have red eyes. Only the ones with red eyes drop vermin. And only the beast patients and scourge beasts with red eyes inflict poison. I think there's a definite connection there. So I think at this point, we can safely conclude that this poison of the vermin is the same poison as the ashen blood. So let's just go ahead and just move it over here and then we can just move this here and now goodbye ash and blood we don't need you anymore because ash and blood is just what the people of old yarnum called it it's not what it actually is goodbye you know just get out of here just goodbye we've only got two categories now the vile bloods and the vermin so here's where it gets a little spooky trying to phrase how I want how I want to put this because it's hard to express into words but if you look at the blood liquors the blood liquors are found in the hunter's nightmare drinking from the river of blood some of them are found in the chalice dungeons and but the the main place they're found is in Canehurst and you know they're they're that's where I uh, first fought a blood liquor was in uh, Canehurst. And then later on, one of them jumped me in a chalice dungeon and scared the shit out of me. <laughs> but Because uh, I didn't know you could find them down there. Um, but yeah, no, I first encountered them in Canehurst. They look kind of like uh, the woman from Ringu. Or Ringu, if you, you know. And, um, but uh, but they're, they're sort of like mosquitoes or ticks or fleas one of those things but what do you find in canehurst next to the blood liquors you find the maggots you find the maggots in castle canehurst in the grounds of castle canehurst next to the blood liquors are the maggots and that's a very serious connection also where do we find the headless bloodletting beast? It's right above Yarnum. 
They're right next to each other. So maybe it's possible that all cases of poison in the entire game, every single case of poison is caused by the vermin. That's a pretty cool idea. I like that. That's food for thought. Maybe the, the blood of the vile bloods, the tainted, corrupted, impure blood of the vile bloods was so rotten and so, so corrupted and filthy and impure that cutting themselves and, and smearing the blood with their, their blade with their blood so riddled with impure filth is enough to cause ashen blood. That's my theory on poison in Bloodborne, that all poison, all poison in the game comes from the vermin. And through the actions of the vile bloods and through the actions of the healing church, it is spread into different sections of the population. Now, what are the vermin? That's a whole other story. But this is the little things in Yarnum. So we don't care about the big spooky vermin. We're here to talk about poison. And that's that. I hope you uh, enjoyed this fifth episode of the little things in Yarnum. Um, for those of you who elected not to watch the personal section, don't feel obligated to. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to. And for those of you who did, um, uh, thank you for, for listening to was was essentially my self-pity. Um, not, you know what? No, it wasn't. It was, it's nice to talk. And I guess this is sort of like therapy. You know what I mean? Like uh, my, my, I don't even know how many subscribers I have. I think I have like 300, whatever, I don't care. My subscribers on YouTube, like 300 subscribers, something like that, are my therapists. So this was talk therapy for me, getting it out there, making myself feel better. Um, if you would like me to go over anything in particular in my next episode, which will be who fucking knows when, uh, let me know, write me a message and uh, tell me what you'd like me to go over. Um, I also considered maybe doing like some kind of live stream thing where I would just like go around and look at things and like invite people to, to just openly ask me to go over random stuff and we would just like wander around just sort of like because that's, that's basically what I did um, when I was writing the Pale Blood Hunt is I would just like wander around Yarnum for like hours at a time just like looking at random things and just sort of like watching the monsters sort of walk by um so, so i don't know that, that that might be cool i don't know we'll see um so thank you for watching uh, i appreciate it very much leave me a message if you'd like me to go over anything in particular uh there will be no schedule no uh it could be tomorrow it could be in seven months i don't know because it's not for you it's for me Thanks a lot for watching. I really appreciate it, guys.